either way. All right, so we are now recording. So once again, welcome everyone. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jim and I will join you again for questions afterwards. Take it away, Jim. All right, thank you, Jamie. So I am Jim Kleinwachter from the Conservation Foundation. I've been out to Lake Hinsdale Village several times and working with Marty and Victor. And um, we are a not-for-profit land trust. There are land trusts like ours across the country and we strictly focus on environmental activities. We do all types of things from uh, education of all ages, uh, I teach at College DuPage and we lecture across the region. We have scientists that are doing water quality testing in the rivers and streams. We have uh, people that are buying land for open space and park districts and forest preserves. We are putting conservation easements on property and private property so to protect their environmental values. Lots of different things that we're doing. And our main office is in Naperville on the McDonald farm. And Victor, I can offer to you and the group, if people want to come down and see our farm, it's a, it's a great field trip area. There's a place where you can have lunch and um, spend a few hours. We have 60 protected acres. You can see right where the, I think you can see my cursor here. The road would have gone right through the middle of the farm and it had not been for the permanent protection of this property. So it's in South Naperville easy to get to. 49 acres are in organic vegetables. We've got butterfly gardens and the farm dates back to the 1870s, but we've upgraded it with new green infrastructure, things like solar panels, wind turbine, uh, two different types of rain harvesting. And we've even put um, right here, the farm, it's called the McDonald farm. Lenore McDonald and her husband lived here and we were able to acquire her birth home. And right where this cursor is, now there's a beautiful stone home that she was born in that we were able to get moved over to this site. So there's a lot of things to see and, and one small area, and it's a beautiful place for a field trip. Why I'm working with Lake Kinsdale Village is because you look at the second line there, 95% of the property in Illinois is private property. So if we're going to try to make our communities better, we're gonna to have to do it um, with conjunction with um, the private properties. And we can apply these to any, and I'll show you some pictures. I'm gonna run through a lot of pictures tonight and then you can comment on them. This is a book by Stephen Kellert and it talks about how we need to stay connected to the environment that we, it's not just that, um, that I'm a nature guy, we all have nature in us and it's it makes us healthy and happy. And this is part of why I think it's important that people get outside more often. And I think your grounds and your property is beautiful for that. And to be understanding that when I'm talking about nature, I'm not just talking about the animals, the humans are actually animals and nature makes us better. And you can see how they use animals in nursing homes to help people feel better and and how water is an integral part of our lives and we have to keep thinking about it as important so we don't have time to go to Yellowstone and go to the forest preserve every day we need a little of that in our own communities this is a quote and it talks about the destruction of the natural assets this is one thing we have to really fight against in our areas. And you see at one point, Chicago had teepees along Lakeshore Drive and the Native Americans were there in their canoes. You see what it is now and trying to keep a piece of that nature alive in our communities is essential. So if I asked you about your happiest memories, this is my daughter dancing in the Mediterranean at two o'clock in the morning, my son and his best friend. We have pets that we bring in our homes. We have plants, we, we like gardening. All of these things are indications that we want to be next to nature. So how do we bring that into our communities, into our lives? And one of the things I'm doing to promote that is a conservation at home program. We're up to 3000 homes across the region 
eight different organizations working together across uh, 16 different counties in Illinois. And we also have a program called Conservation at Work where we bring the same concepts to corporate properties and non-residential type sites. So we wanna work towards getting Lake Kinsdale Village, the conservation at home site, since it is a residential housing unit and you can have one of those signs at your place. We work with park districts, everybody to help bring this conservation areas back. So this was an area I'm, I'm standing on a bridge here looking out and I saw a mink swim by in the creek. And because we've created these habitats, you have other creatures that can utilize these parks too. It's not just all about ball fields, it's about passive recreation. When you're either walking with your kids or your grandchildren or your dog, you have beautiful landscapes that are rich in life. Pretty simple things I'm talking about that we wanna I think we wanna to try to implement in, on your property there. Thinking about the water and the function, attracting the right kind of wildlife, reduction of chemical use, grass where it doesn't belong can be taken out, healthier soils and a big and diverse tree inventory, including oak trees. We're working with Morton Arboretum on an oak tree recovery program. A lot of our area was covered with oaks. We've lost a tremendous amount of them and integrating a diverse landscape of trees is an important part of uh, any landscape. So we start with the, the plants on this earth are not just decorations, they're functional plants. And we have to understand that all life derives from plants. So the sun is the power, it, uh, the, the amazing photosynthesis happens within the plants and creates all the other life. Even the oxygen that we breathe, the water that we see and drink, all of that was created in the atmosphere conditions that was caused by the plants over thousands of years. And all of the other animals that have evolved have come through and utilized plants as the base of every food chain. So once we understand that plants are essential, they're not just pretty, then we have to keep thinking about what plants we wanna choose. And in the picture here with the hummingbird, if you don't see hummingbirds outside of your unit, it's because we don't have something for them. They don't come for a cup of coffee or to chat. They're looking for food and we either have it or we don't. So we can direct and change what visits our property based on what kind of um, environmental conditions we provide for them. This is a beautiful grass called prairie drop seed. And it's one of the ones I would suggest that we use along the lake shore. It's a small clumping grass and it's got a beautiful scent in the fall. It can be mixed with other flowering plants. It has a tremendous root system. I'll show you how that root systems can work. But this is one base plant that I think is really nice to use. It, it doesn't matter if it's dry. Um, it does very well in extremely dry conditions along the top, um, not down near the water, but further up. So the difference between these native plants that I'm talking about and the standard plants that you might see is the evolution. And in the animal world, we understand evolution. We understand a giraffe has a long neck and a turtle has a shell that it can carry around, but we don't understand or appreciate the fact that these plants are evolved differently. They have root systems that are ginormous that um, are doing a lot of things. They protect themselves by going underground. So they're long lived and perennial plants and they're increasing the soil capacity, um, adding organic nutrients to the soil and breaking up that clay. On the far left is turf grass, which is not even a native species for Illinois or the United States for that matter. And we've covered so much of that with it. I'll talk about that in a minute. But look at the massive root structures of some of these native plants. And that's a scale um, photo courtesy of the National Geographic, just to give you an idea of what you don't see below ground. 
So first we have to understand that the lake that you have there is a functional thing. The water has to be stored somewhere that falls on the property. You've got roads and buildings and a lot of impervious surfaces there, sidewalks. And the water was created, areas for the water was created to both be pretty and also a, pl a storage place for water. On the picture on the right, a lot of places have it fenced off and uh, many of them are called detention basins and there's never a good connotation with the detention. You know, whether you got it in high school or detention camp, it's always a place to put somebody that has been bad. And uh, we need to quit thinking about bad water, fence it off. Um, on the left, you're seeing poor water conditions in these retention or detention areas. Uh, a lot of times they draw geese, eroded shorelines, and we have a little bit of that on your property. And we're trying to get away from that look. We work with DuPage County and they're suggesting on all new projects that a 15 foot buffer be used on all pond edges. You're grandfathered from being required to do that all over those ponds. But this is the current thinking as to how it should be. And the way that yours are now with grass to the edge would not even be allowed on a newer development. There are ways of making it look different. This is a sedge planting. So sedges are grass similar plants. They look similar to grass, but they're different and they don't keep growing. So they will gently fall over and we can utilize these as a base. You can even have flowers added into these sedge areas. So especially on areas where it's difficult to grow, uh, eroded areas, um, there are sedges that will grow in the deep shade, wet conditions, you name it. There's a, um, a family of sedges that we could use to put on some of those tough areas. We, we have to keep rethinking what we've done with our pond and stream edges and erosion is a huge issue. And in these types of situations, we have uh, gotten rid of the erosion. We've gotten rid of the geese. They do not like any type of vegetation where there could be a coyote hiding. And instead you have herons and you have a variety of things. This is better for fishing. You've got crayfish and you've got frogs. The bass come in to eat the frogs. So it's a, a diverse ecologically sound area as, as opposed to some of the other um, grass shoreline areas. This is right uh, the first picture on the left is a picture looking back at the clubhouse from the trail. And a lot of what you see in the water there is um, algae and, and milfoil, duckweed. And those grow oftentimes in the summer and they're one of the indications that the water is, it's called eutrophication that happens to lakes. There's a abundance of nutrients in the water. So typically that would be phosphorus and nitrogen. A lot of times from fertilizer putting on, put on the grass that washes right down into the water. Grass clippings can add to it as well as leaves. There's a lot of things that happen in these ponds, but having the native plants like you see in the center will help. Those plants will suck the nutrients out of the water and use that nutrient to grow these flowering plants. These three photos were taken on your property there. And you can see how what we're proposing would be beautiful as opposed to this one on the left where I don't stop here and say, oh my gosh, this is just so beautiful. And it's not habitat over here for anything but geese really, um, where these native plants will bring in birds and butterflies, that type of thing. This is milkweed right here, swamp milkweed. It can grow right down by the water. And we know the story of the monarch, they need the milkweed. So this is a swallowtail here, it's nectaring off of the coneflower. 
another grouping of pictures, the areas that you do have that are beautiful. I really enjoyed looking at the naturalized areas and also saw some that were not so good looking areas. And I think there's plenty of places for improvement. And if done right with lower profile things, it won't um, hinder the view of out onto the water. I know the area on this side over here was um, eroding pretty strongly. Um, so this is the, some of the things that could be done on some of these areas to make them more stable and prettier too. Birds, if you're any, anybody likes birds, 50% of the bird count was these four species. I know you have the geese there, uh, the starling and this English sparrow are both invasive species in Illinois and grackles are really ones we don't need as many of. And look at the colors as I move to, this is what we have typically too many of, and this is what we really wanna have, the colors of these birds. And what the birds are looking for most of the year, they'll eat, this group will eat seeds. This hummingbird, we typically feed them with sugar water and that's not a sustainable food source for it. It's a nice pickup, like me drinking a Pepsi, but it's not sustainable food. And all of the sustainable food that these birds get um, all summer long is bugs. They feed the bugs to their young, it's the protein source, and seeds are a secondary choice for them. This grouping eats almost exclusively bugs. This Oriole will take some oranges or some grape jelly, but they live off of bugs. Bluebirds, um, this is the little wren we like to hear singing, 100% bugs. Even the hummingbird, what he eats for his protein and his food are ants. So the bugs are on these plants that I'm talking about, the native plants, they're not in the grass. Many of these birds will switch the indigo bunting here and Orioles tanager over here and the cedar waxwing will switch to berries. So if we planted viburnum, service berry, some of those berry shrubs, we can have these birds that will come and feast on those berries. So we can build habitat for any of these birds that you like. And the monarch's another example of a plant-based insect that needs, it's very specific, it needs milkweed to lay eggs on. But we don't wanna focus on any one thing. We wanna create a diverse habitat with lots of things for a variety of different things. Everybody sees the monarch, everybody loves butterflies. And we use that as to give people understanding that, yes, we can build the monarch habitat, we love butterflies, but there's also grasshoppers and crickets and a lot of different things that we need to have in a diverse uh, landscape. It's pretty simple for a lot of these creatures. They just need water, shelter, and a place to lay eggs and raise their young. This was a site in April that we worked on, and this was the before and after. We wanna create, you've got a good system of pathways and it's beautiful to have people be able to enter into these planted areas and see and hear and smell the sights and the sounds of a vibrant, diverse habitat. So what do we do in a residential area? This homeowner called and said, well, we'd like to implement conservation here. We have problems with the water pouring out and it pours down onto the sidewalk we don't have any birds, we don't have any butterflies. What would you do with a residential area? And what we did was lowered the landscape away from the sidewalk. So it's lower over here. The water now comes down, pours over there, no longer piles up on the sidewalk. We created edges where the flower beds are defined from the grass. And we planted some of these native plants in here that when they're mature, they will create areas for birds and butterflies to utilize it. And the birds can utilize the water over here. So you can see how we're making these better and more functional. Part of the thing is solving the problems that you have. 
So it doesn't matter if it's hot, dry, shady, we can find things for that. And I was working with Victor, we looked at a number of different areas on your site. The idea is they can be less costly and less problematic to maintain. A lot of the stuff that I would see across the landscapes when I'm out there, all you have to do is if your favorite plant is out there, um, Google where it came from. And even things like lilacs are not from Illinois. And it's not that they're bad, any of these are bad, they're, they're fine. But we have to understand that they're not integrated with the wildlife. So they're just there for beauty. In most of the cases, they don't give additional value to the landscape with deep roots, um, feeding wildlife, improving the soil, um, pulling the water out of the river or the, or the lake in your case, they're not doing those things. So they better be darn pretty in order to pay their way because they're not providing any environmental function. So some of the native stuff that we're trying to do, these bluebells down here, they're amazing in, in a shaded wood, wooded area. Uh, this cardinal flower will grow in the water. Turtle heads a water loving one, so is blue flag iris, milkweed that we talked about. Blazing star over here is very attractive to a variety of uh, pollinators, including the, the butterflies and bees. So if it can be better and pretty, you know, what's the problem with that? So you've got a lot of grass and a lot of times it's fed. This first number on a bag of fertilizer is nitrogen. And a lot of that's ending up in the lake. And grass has zero wildlife value. So I'm not suggesting you get rid of all your grass, but we reduce some areas of it. We've covered the United States in grass. Illinois has more grass than corn and soybeans together. 39 of the lower 48 states have more grass than anything else. A lot of the states that are here that don't have grass as the main thing are either mountainous states, uh, Nevada is mostly a desert, or sparsely populated areas where humans haven't dominated the landscape yet and taken over. Some of the areas, you know, like the Dakotas, you, it's surprising that there's grass, even in Minnesota, you wouldn't think that there's more grass than forests. But you look at how much we're spending on grass, $40 billion a year, 20 million acres of unproductive crop. And you can see it on your property, how much of the uh, property is lawn. And Victor could tell you how much money of your association fees goes towards lawn mowing and care of the grass areas. And look, this is in Geneva along a pathway, left or right, which one's prettier? Which one is blooming in the middle of a drought? The grass on the left is dead and yet they're still mowing it. And if you were there with your grandkids walking down this path, don't you think they'd be drawn to the right side? The orange is milkweed and cone flowers and that very drop seed I talked to you about. So very beautiful areas can be landscaped to be sustainable, low maintenance, lower maintenance certainly than grass and functional. We've created a seed mix for these areas and instead of being a prairie, which is oftentimes tall, this is a meadow concept and it's short like knee high to waist high at the greatest and covered with um, a higher grade of a uh, higher amount of forbs. So plants can be categorized into grasses or flowering plants. The flowering plants are called forbs and this is heavily forb filled type area, which I would recommend because they look nicer with short grasses and flowers than they would in a in a tall grass situation or one with less flowers. We've even sold it to the tollway. So this area here is about 50% less maintenance than the mowed area here. I don't want this mowed area. It's called the um, front slope and it's filled with 
salt and broken car parts and so on, but the back slope here where the water would uh, build up in this ditch is now naturalized. This white is very attractive to hummingbirds. It's Penstemon digitalis, the one they've used for heart medicines. So I'm showing you pictures of these and trying to understand that we've got problems with water pollution. In your case, you can see where water hitting the higher areas of your property is washing down into the lake and carrying with it whatever off the parking lots, whatever um, materials that it can gather, and it ends up in the lake. The runoff is the easy term for non-point source pollution, but water travels very easily across grass. So what we're trying to do is keep the water on the property. Your area is connected, your lake is connected on um, several places where water comes in and water goes out. And these drain heads that you see away from the lake, they look pretty um, normal. In this case, we're trying to plant them with plants that will absorb that water before it gets in here, because once it gets in the lake, there's very hard to get that um, sediment back out. And the lakes fill in, you don't wanna to have to think about dredging the lakes and all that sediment that builds up in, in these kind of ponds. So avoiding it is, is a much better solution. So that's kind of where we're at. And what I'm trying to do, my role is to assist and to give uh, advice. And I'm doing that on, uh, without charge to you. Um, we don't um, provide fee for pay services so that you know that my advice is good because I'm not getting paid to give it. Um, and this little picture down here, this little uh, logo is from DuPage County and they um, want us to be bringing these messages to you. So it's backed up by science. Anything, I, I'm happy to answer your questions that you might have about um, what I'm proposing, what I would like to see happen there. And I know some of the residents are on board with the idea and some may not be. Have there been questions, Jamie? Um, well, one question, if you could uh, talk maybe a little more specifically for a minute about uh, erosion control and how native, uh, native plants can help with erosion control. Sure. So you saw the deep roots and every year about 25% of that root mass that you saw um, is cast off and improves the organic material in soil. So a lot of what you see in eroded soils is you see the rock and the sand that has remained after the good black dirt has eroded away and ended up in the lake. So these plants will hold all that black soil and actually create more organic matter in the soil and improves the soil with the better soils you get worms and other soil creatures. And the plants are actually improving the soil so that they can propagate themselves and fill in the areas. So over time, it becomes a thick mat of, lee, of um, roots that then are pulling nutrients out of the water and not dumping more nutrient load into the water. Some of the areas that you have are steep and the steeper it is, the more erosion you're going to get. So that's another reason why we wanna slow that erosion down using these native plants. All right, so we have two questions about runoff here that I'm gonna kind of combine them because I think the answer may be similar. Uh, Karen says, we have runoff coming into our lake from other areas we can't control. What about them? And Al says, what can be done about the inflow from the marsh just south of 67th Street? That marsh drains from all the lawns in the surrounding community that we can't control. Yeah, uh, a lot of the areas that we have um, have inputs and outputs. Um, what you have is called inline detention, which is not even allowed anymore um, because it flows into your pond and then you add to it or fix it and then it flows somewhere else. So somebody else is talking right now about 
the pipe that they have that comes from you. So the term that we kind of laughingly talk about was we all live downstream. Yes, you do live, you do have pipes coming in from other subdivisions and then your pipe goes out to other places. So the best we can do is make it better where we are, just like at your home. Dogs that walk by, you know, we can't help that you found dog poop in your yard, but you remove it and take care of it. So each one of our yards is better. So that's my answer in the short term is we're going to try to fix that water coming in. If it's good water, fine. If it's not so great, then let's let's make it better before it leaves our place. And this the solution is plants. We're not going to mechanically draw that water out and filter it and spend the money. We're going to let these plants do it. And in this picture, this black swallowtail here is some of the enjoyment we get from it. Something like these black eyed Susans here are a beautiful way of landscaping that provides that function and help clean the water. Yep. And it should probably be noted too that some of these plants are actually known to pull toxins out of water. So things like nitrogen, um, other uh, fertilizers, things like that, they'll actually suck it out and purify the water then before it goes into the pond or your lake or whatever body of water. There's a site that we've visited in Lake County where they're pumping this brown water out of the Des Plaines River and they run it through constructed wetlands and it comes out crystal clear on the other side. So it's amazing what these plants can do. We don't often really get to see it, what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Victor wants to know, when will the areas we just planted with tall grass that are currently covered in seed blanket bloom and will they help with algae? The seeded areas take a while, um, typically two years before you're gonna see some of the early blooming things like the Black Eyed Susan perhaps would bloom in the second year. So um, the conservation terms we teach are, it, um, what is it, creep and then leap, sleep, creep, leap, that's it. So the first year you don't see much, the second year you get a little bit, and the third year, it looks really well. Um, in areas where you want an instant boom, it costs more, but we put the plants in. So I, we can, you know, if there are areas up near the buildings or around trees, we would put plants in and have a much more immediate um, boost. But on larger areas, and especially steep slope ones, um, the seeding is much more economical and just have to wait a little bit more. All right, and kind of on the back of that, Ron and Lucy want to know what's been planted to date? Uh, we're staying with low profile things so that we don't want the eight foot high cup plant and big blue stem. So keeping a lower profile, a variety of prairie species, including a lot of, of the forbs that we talked about, the colorful flowery plants, have been planted in those areas. I looked at the, um, you're working with tall grass and Victor has a list of the plants. If you wanted to see them, you would have to ask him for specifics, but I looked over the plant list and it seemed very appropriate for lakeside planting. Okay. Uh, Al wants to know, have you surveyed the marsh south of us? Are there any plants there that can pull the nutrients that collect in it? And what are the chances of getting dairy in to help out with this? Those are good questions. I don't specifically remember the marsh area. Um, and a lot of municipalities do help and, and the connectivity of other um, properties, both where the incoming water comes from, that could be something that you could talk to the village about. But I can't answer that question. I haven't been asked to work with Darian at all on this project. Okay. Um, I think I'm scrolling back through here. I think that might be all the questions. Oh, Richard has one. Uh, says they make a machine that takes the lake algae out and puts it where you want to get rid of it. Is that any good? Um, 
typically that's a quick fix and very costly. So we typically don't see that very often. Um, you're just moving a problem somewhere else and it's gonna grow back very quickly. So the plants have to get established that pull the nitrogen out of the water because that rich plant water is what the algae grows from. And if you went to the trouble of hauling it out, um, it would grow back before you turned around. We had a, a thing a guy had um, invented, it was called a algae rake. It was a plastic floating rake that you could throw out into the algae and rake it, bring it back with a rope. You brought it back to shore. But we found when we areas we cleared filled in almost as fast as we could um, pull it out. So it was not a long term solution to just pull it out. All right. And Ron and Lucy also want to know would you recommend replacing all grass areas on our lakefront? Well, there's been some discrepancy in what is meant by grass. So I know there was a report from Burke Engineering that talked about having grasses along the shoreline. And what they were referring to are native long rooted grasses, not the typical turf grass. I showed you that root system on turf grass. So if I call it turf grass, that is the kind that you could buy at the Home Depot or whatever. In a, in a sod mat, that turf grass is really not good for direct shoreline areas. So if there was a place where people go fishing or maybe a photo spot for weddings or something like that, you wanted to have an outlook with some grass around it, that's fine. But most of the areas, especially along the water's edge, would be much better if they were naturalized. And again, the county would not even allow you to put in turf up to the water like you have in many areas. So that's my answer there. Grasses themselves, if they were naturalized grasses, low profile or those sedges I talked about, that would be good, but not the regular turf grass down to the water. All right, we had a few more questions come in here. Nicholas wants to know, is there an estimate of the total grass area that will be recovered and how much landscaping fees might be reduced? Uh, I think you're doing it a little at a time. Victor would be the one to say how much that they are able to do on a per year basis in, in uh, changing over. Um, the typical cost of mowing versus maintaining native is generally given at 50%. I've seen it more even up to 60, but that's long-term reduction of the mowing group and um, paying a little bit more to the maintenance of the landscaping, of the native landscaping with the tall grass group that you're working with. Okay. Uh, Richard continues with his question. Um, you said costly, but they've spent over 200,000 on chemicals getting the algae out um, is better than looking at it. So the machine they're looking at is 30K. And you have to dump that algae somewhere else that's loaded with nutrients. So um, again, long-term, you don't want to be pouring the chemical or hauling material out of the water. You wanna make the water more natural that doesn't grow that algae. So it's gonna take a while to, to turn around what's, you know, I don't know how long the villages have been there, but a lot of these older subdivisions have been there for many years and they have multiple complex conditions that are already existing in the pond. So it's not gonna turn around overnight. All right, um, Karen wants to know, what about fish to help remove things that it feeds on like the algae? The fish that you wanna have are the native fish like bass and crappies and bluegill. And they will help create a diverse um, water conditions. Things like grass carp that eat algae are not a long-term fix. And in many cases, they're not, um, they've, even though they say they're hybrid, they've found that they have gotten out and that's not a long-term fix either. 
if, if that's the kind of fish you were talking about. But a healthy pond can be used for fishing and recreational purposes. And I've seen the, some of the fish come out of your ponds at a very good place to fish, it looks like. All right, on a similar vein, um, Ron and Lucy are asking, can we ever plant enough to clear the water? Would we have to dredge our lake to keep it clean with the plants? Well, dredging is very costly and I don't, I don't think that that's a legitimate option. It's same as doing things like riprap around the shorelines. It's not a very effective and very costly. So what we're proposing is the least expensive and most aesthetically pleasing concepts that is backed by science and the county. Um, so there are steps in the right direction and long term we'll have to see how this does but you certainly want to start with the least expensive and the prettiest option first. All right. Al has a question, and this is not something I'm familiar with. Have you observed any communities that use nanobubble treatments to help eat the nutrients? I have worked with um, the bubblers, and it, when done properly, it has um, can have a profound effect. I know um, some of the aerators, the fountains that are put in in the ponds. That's another option that you could look at, and there are companies that. Um, I know you've been working with one. There are several that look at different technologies and different uh, types of treatments. So they're not just spraying chemical. There might be a combination of things that could be used. And I'm sure um, Victor could talk more about that because he's dealt with some of the water quality um, improvements and worked with those firms that specifically um, would give you alternatives like that. All right, well, I think it's just probably about time for us to wrap up here. I'll close with a comment from Lynn. Uh, she says, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. LHV has the ability to become a beautiful habitat for nature. I realize it's a slow process, but I can't wait to see the change. I'm very grateful Marty contacted you. Very good, you've got my information on the screen. Um, call me, any other questions you wanna have, I, my email's there and Marty and, um, Victor both have my contact information, so I'm happy to help and uh, look forward to continue working with you. All right, well, thank you everyone and take care. And we'll have this recording available. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we wanna put it on YouTube. We'll get you the link as to how we're gonna record this. So I'll make sure that everybody. you get it. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Take care.